Hello everybody. In this video we're going to cover section 4.4. We're going to learn how to explain the concepts of theoretical yield and limiting reactions or reagents. We're going to derive theoretical yield for a reaction under specific conditions and we're going to calculate percent yield for a reaction. So, so far we've been talking about the relative amounts of reactants and products represented by a balanced chemical reactions. These are called our stoichiometric amounts, the amounts that are going to mix to give us a complete reaction. All right. Um, in actuality, though, you're rarely going to have the correct stoichiometric amounts in your uh, reaction mixture. Okay. And instead, you're going to have a little bit more or less of one of the reagents than what would be ideal. And to think about this, it is useful to think about um, like cooking, if we're going to go back to that example. Let's say that you're going to make a grilled cheese sandwich, and a grilled cheese sandwich is consists of one slice of cheese and two slices of bread. I'm able to make a, a grilled cheese sandwich. Let's say that I go to my bread loaf, though. I see that I have a fresh loaf. It's got 28 slices of bread in there. I go to get my cheese out, and I see I have 11 pieces of cheese left. All right. Um, this means that I can produce at a maximum 11 sandwiches. All right, so let's picture this together. Two slices of bread, piece of cheese, that makes a cheese sandwich, grilled cheese. If I have 28 slices of bread and 11 slices of cheese, I'm going to be able to produce 11 sandwiches. In doing so, I'm going to consume 22 slices of bread. I have 28 slices of bread though, so I'm going to have six slices of bread left over. All right. This means that the cheese, I would need more cheese in order to make more sandwiches. Cheese is therefore my limiting reactant. Okay. The amount of cheese I had decided how much I could ultimately, how many sandwiches I could ultimately make. All right. The limiting reagent is always going to be completely consumed, right? I didn't have any cheese left after I made my sandwiches, right? The bread was provided in excess, and it is therefore called an excess reactant. And I will have bread left over. Now, let's see if we can apply this to our chemical equation, all right? Now consider the chemical process where we have a hydrogen molecule plus a chlorine molecule is going to produce two HCl molecules. Imagine that we combine three moles of H2 and two moles of Cl2. Now in this simple example where we can see that one mole of this is consumed for every one mole of this, we can see pretty clearly that we're going to use up the chlorine first. All right. We're going to uh, use up two moles of chlorine. That limiting reagent is going to be completely consumed. We're going to need to consume two moles of hydrogen in doing so. And we're going to have one mole of hydrogen left over. Right? But oftentimes it's not very obvious. It's not very obvious to inspect this and see what's going to happen. One approach for determining the limiting reactant involves comparing the amount of product expected for the complete reaction of each reactant. All right. So I choose the product. In this case, I only have one, but it could be any one of the products. All right. It doesn't matter which one you chose. And I'm going to use the stoichiometric factors in order to calculate how much of that product I could produce given the amount that I started with of each reagent. So let's try that real quick. If I started with three moles of hydrogen, I need to consume one mole for every two moles of HCl. I could produce six moles of uh, HCl if I had Cl2 in excess. If I have two moles of chlorine, I get two moles of HCl for every one mole of chlorine. I can produce four moles of HCl if hydrogen was in excess. All right. Now that I have these two, I can decide which is the limiting reagent. And the limiting reagent is going to be the one that produces the least product. It's going to get consumed first. Once I've produced four moles of HCl, I will produce the maximum amount that I can produce. All right. So by inspecting this, I can see that Cl 
is my limiting reagent, and H2 is going to be my excess reactant. If we picture this happening, we have chlorine molecules and hydrogen molecules. They're going to produce HCl molecules, and I'm going to have some excess hydrogen that's left over. So my ultimately, my product mixture is going to be a mixture of the product and the excess reactant that I started off with. And this kind of really demonstrates why it is important to mix things as closely as possible to stoichiometric amounts whenever possible. Because ultimately, if what I want to get is HCl, I'm going to have to remove any of the excess reactants that are left over. Now, we're, since we're on the theme of talking about things being less than ideal, we're going to talk about yields, theoretical versus actual yields. Now, back here, I saw that my maximum yield, given uh, the reagents that I had, was going to be 4 moles of HCO. That is what we would consider the theoretical yield, the one that we calculate from the stoichiometry of the balanced chemical reaction. In practice, though, you're not going to see this theoretical yield, all right? In practice, you're going to get some amount that's less than that theoretical amount of yield that we call the actual yield, all right? And there's a lot of different reasons why you won't get there. There's competing side reactions. You could have an incomplete reaction. It doesn't, it, things didn't go all the way to the products and some reactants remained. Or you could just have a difficult recovery of the product, you know, you might have trouble getting it out of the reaction mixture. All right. So what we're interested in is what is the percent yield, therefore, of a reaction, right? In, the in, in practice, we want high percent yields. We want 100% yield if we could, where the actual yield is the same as the theoretical yield. But we will settle for a high percent yield. Okay, and the way we're going to calculate percent yield is we're going to take the actual amount that we got, we're going to divide it by the theoretical yield, the maximum amount we possibly could have gotten, and we're going to multiply that by 100%. All right, um, notice that these are both going to have the same units. All right, they're going to need to have the same units. Now, those units could be mass or they could be moles. And actually, it will work out to be the same value regardless of if you use moles or mass. Um, and I would actually like to see you guys go and try that in a problem and prove that to yourself. But they, they will be the exact same. So let's go through a little example here. Upon reaction of 1.274 grams of copper sulfate with excess zinc metal, 0.392 grams of copper metal was obtained according to this equation. All right, so we were given the mass that we started off with of this copper sulfate. We know we have more than enough zinc to react with it, and we produce 0.392 grams of copper metal. We're being asked, what is the percent yield? Well, since we know zinc is in excess, we know we consumed all of our copper sulfate. That means that uh, we can use that as our limiting reagent. Again, we're going to start with the mass of copper sulfate, and we're going to go straight to the moles of copper sulfate, um, where I'm calculating the molar mass of copper sulfate here to get the moles of copper sulfate. I'm going back to my reaction here and seeing that I have a 1 to 1 stoichiometric factor there. So I'm going to produce one mole of copper for every one mole of, co of copper sulfate. I'm now in moles of copper. I multiply not by the molar mass of the copper sulfate now because I'm in moles of copper, but by the molar mass of copper itself. And I see that the maximum yield I could have gotten is 0 0.5072 grams of copper. Right. So this is the exact same problem we did before with stoichiometric factors, but we were asked for some additional information. Okay, we're being asked what is the percent yield for this reaction. So we're going to have another step. We're going to come down here and look at our percent yield equation. Right? We're going to plug this in for our theoretical yield because that's the one that we determined using the stoichiometric factors. 
and we're up here we're going to have the actual yield and that's a value that's going to have to be given to you because that's a measurement that you took after you actually did the reaction right we do this we see that we're canceling our grams of copper multiply it by 100 and we'll find that we got a 77.3 percent yield